you were dropping off. Oh, that's good. Uh, okay. Well, good morning to everyone. Good morning. And uh, it's a kind of an exciting morning here. We're going to be stepping out into the some new territory and and uh, break free from the Old Testament for uh, for a while. And uh, we will be coming back and making a study of the priesthood eventually. Uh, and also of uh, the sacrificial system that'll round out our our series on the tabernacle and uh, how God used it in the uh, the days before Christ to picture and foretell us a lot of things uh, uh, concerning the coming Messiah that we wouldn't know other all because it's a foreshadowing. The uh, tabernacle and the old law, the law and so on, was the foreshadowing of the coming Redeemer. And uh, we learn a lot about, about the Lord just as we make that kind of a study. We pick up things there that we won't pick up in the New Testament concerning some of the fine points that God wanted us to know about him. So uh, we free uh, ourselves from uh, that study for for a oh, couple months. And um, I'll be uh, sharing with you how we go through that uh, here in a, just a little bit. First, let's start always uh, with prayer. And then just um, I'd like to have you share with me what uh, what's the meaning of unity? We talk about unity. So what does unity mean to you? How would you describe it in, in different words? How would you say it if you didn't? Hit? Someone says, tell me about unity, but don't use the word. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your presence this morning. For this opportunity to fellowship around your word with you. To be taught by thy Holy Spirit as he ministers to each one of us. And uh, it's our desire, Lord, to um, know you closer, know you more intimately, uh, to share our lives with you on a moment-by-moment -moment basis throughout every day of the week. And uh, it's our desire, Lord, to keep growing and think your thoughts after you and be fruitful as you work in us and through us to your own honor and glory. Uh, we commit this time to you, use it in us, guide us in our thinking, and we'll be careful to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, well, our topic is um, unity. Uh, and uh, for one thing, if we're going to be studying something, we ought to at least have some common understanding of what's, what's the center of our discussion. Uh, just uh, kind of brainstorm a little bit. Uh, what does you? What is unity? How would you describe unity? With a uh, but use different terms, different words. Fellowship. Unity is a fellowship. I like that. Because what's fellowship? Definitely. Uh, that's what I was. Togetherness. Thinking. Togetherness. Good. Oneness. Oneness. Same beliefs. Same. A coming together of multiple parts for a single purpose. For a good. It's good, good. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> At least they're, un they're unified in that. <laughs> Another good one. Yeah. Unified. One. One. Common. Good. Not uniformity. Right. But in all the parts working together. And there's no one who sees how it all works. Only one person sees how it all works, but the Lord brings it all together. Yes. 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 Good. You guys have such a good concept of it. I don't know if we need to tap into it. We're done. Yeah. Yeah. Give everybody a name. We'll go home. <laughs> can you think of any other words that uh, kind of fit with the meaning of unity that we haven't already mentioned agreement yes agreements bonding together 
Bonding? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any others? Group. What, what do you say? Group. A group? All right. Uh, would harmony fit that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you have a lot of different pieces that all work together as one. And some of them is, uh, has been mentioned, as um, Mike has mentioned. So these are all good words. And uh, these are words that uh, fit it very well because unity is um, something we have all a concept of, but often we don't see how that concept works. That's our trouble. We know what it is, but we don't know exactly uh, how it works. And it, is it important uh, to God? Does God have anything to say about unity? Yeah. A little less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If God has said a lot about unity, then of course, uh, where do we go to find out what those thoughts he had are? In the word. In scripture. Mm -hmm. The written word. So it should send us on a challenge to see from God's own word what he has to say about it. And then see how that word how uh, comes into the picture at this point. Well, we'll see what God had to say about it. And I think what we're going to end up finding out is how he makes unity work. Because uh, obviously, unity doesn't come natural to us as human beings. Um, <clears throat> give you an illustration in life where it's pretty obvious that unity doesn't come natural to man. Politics. Politics. You mean you're not going to do it my way? Yeah. Okay. Want to start with Cain and Abel? Yeah. Where are there divisions in our existence? Religion, mm -hmm. different religions. Religions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People today are squabbling over just about every kind of difference you can you can think of, whether you've got dark skin, light skin, in between skin. Uh, whether your eyes are blue or green or dark, or uh, and we've got uh, differences and conflicts, like you said, in religion. How, how I'm not sure of the number of them, but how many denominations and Christian churches are there in the world today? <laughs> Innumerable, hundreds. It is. It's over. I don't know, it's probably a couple hundred anyway, but I think you're absolutely right. We're not all Methodists. We're not all Baptists. We're not, you know where I'm going. We've got so many denominations. And I wonder what God thinks of that. And what should be, if God, if God is going, has uh, unity in his mind and in his heart, you wonder how is this, uh, uh, around us uh, able to be changed and does it need to be changed and if so how and so these are a lot of questions that we'll be discussing and and studying as we go through 10, 10 sessions and 10 uh, different passages of scripture and I'm going to show you how we're going to be doing that and every week we're going to have a different discussion around the issue of unity. And uh, each week will be, there will be a short um, passage of scripture to, um, to, to make a study of. And then what we'll do is we'll come back together and discuss, discuss and talk about what God's word has to say out of those, uh, usually it's about four, five, six verses at the most. So uh, you're not going to be challenged to read books, but passages that are specific in God's word related to unity. And um, so 
I think you've answered the first question I had in my mind, and I, I uh, hope it's the same answer in yours, is that why study unity? Because there's so little of it. <laughs> For one thing, there's so little of it, and God has so much to say about it. Wow, that sets up that sets up uh, an issue that's very interesting. So little. Why is there so little of it? And what does God have to say about dealing with that? Uh, because it's um, all over our our existence. It's all over our country. Like you said, politics, everything mm -hmm. is uh, chaotic. We've got some people uh, trying to live a normal life. And you got other people burning the city down, you know, and um, trying to divide people more and more and more in every way they can think of. And so it's chaotic in the world. It's hard to believe that here in the United States, we've got the most peaceful country, I think. I don't know if everybody would agree with that. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, seeing the world <clears throat> news, you can see people are happy campers and Name about any country you want to. Uh, there's chaos all over the place, conflicts and divisions. And uh, it's not different even in churches, because in churches, that's one of Satan's uh, ways of operating is to get a division in there of any kind that he can make people take sides and uh, cause division and discord and get people's attention away from the Lord himself and, and his ways and go the ways of the world, which uh, is, is just plain chaos. So it's part of life as a nation, as part of our um, existence as, as a fam in families. Look at all the chaos in families. I think the divorce rate now is somewhere around 80%. Somewhere around there, it's a lot. Let me put it that way. It's uh, not what it used to be. Uh, I know when I was a kid, it was if there was a divorce, it was a very unusual thing. And uh, today, it's the common thing. Mm -hmm. And so our homes are riddled with it. Our personal lives are are riddled with uh, even chaos in our process of thinking and living before the Lord. Too bad we don't follow the advice that God gives us in Philippians about thinking on the right things. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry about it and pray about everything and keep your mind going in these directions. And he gives us a whole list of directions. And if we were doing that, our individual life would be uh, much improved as God works in that through us. So, uh, in our church lives, uh, we're evidence that we ourselves, uh, we started out and we had a big split and cut us in half if worse than that. Why? Because the lack of, there was lack of unity there. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of good um, reasons for to study unity because if uh, we need to fix it, if, if we don't go uh, in the direction that God gives us, so that's going to be the thing we're looking for, what God thinks about it. And uh, your answer was right. His answer is in the word. So that's where we have to start. And uh, uh, this uh, time that we spend together today is just going to be to introduce us and get our minds thinking in the, in the direction of unity. And then we'll, uh, and then use our, what did I call last week? Uh, when I was a kid, we called our study materials quarterlies. Remember quarterlies? Mm -hmm. Well, we've got 10, uh, 10 lessons in this, and each of you are going to have one of these, and we'll talk about how to use them. But uh, I think a good place to start, considering the issue of what does God think about unity, a good place to kind of just kind of lay a little foundation uh, for the beginning of our study is to do so in John chapter 17. So uh, we can turn there for just a minute. John 17, of course, we find ourselves here uh, just 
Well, it's it's at a at a location that uh, is usually called the high high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's the, that time in his life when his uh, earthly ministry was wrapping up, and uh, where he was soon he was soon now to uh, go to the cross, deal with the issue of sin once and for all, go to the cross. And then depart. And I bring that point up for this reason. Jesus knew where he was, knew where he was, and what the situation was, what he was about to face, but also what his loved ones, his people, his believers uh, were going to face as well. So something was on his mind. In the area we're talking about, we'll see it right here in John 17, because if we start in verse 4, here the Lord is in an intimate prayer with his heavenly Father. And uh, his heavenly Father was told by him, he said, I have glorified thee on earth. Because why? He's finished his course. He says here, having accomplished the work which thou has given me to do, I've come here on purpose. I've come here for a specific uh, task to do. And he said, I've done it. The job's finished. I'm about to wrap it up and come home. <laughs> and uh, he says, so uh, we know that he was aware of the situation that he was in, and that is, uh, followers would be in after he left. So he says, I've accomplished the work, and now he says in verse 13, and then now he says, I'm coming home, but now I come to thee. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy made full in themselves. What he's got to say following is his answer for joy in the believer. Can't forget that. As a believer, do I want to live in the joy of the Lord? Or what? Jesus said, I'm coming to thee, and uh, that they, his followers, may have joy made full in themselves. The Lord wants us joyful. He don't want us to be down in the mouth and all discouraged all the time and upset and uh, button heads with one another and and uh, not being together and having fellowship. He said, I want your joy to be full. So he goes on to say, and I'm going to give you some direction in that. So he said in verse 14, just down one more, I have given them what? Word. Word. He gave us the word. Well, like he, you already said, where's the answer? The word. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. So he said, I've given them thy word. And uh, uh, go down a couple verses to verse 17. So I'm kind of skipping spot just to give the flow of things here. He says... He's given us the word, but what are we supposed to do with that? How does that word become the, the driver? Uh, we can learn it. We can study it. We can study the word. We could, if you had the gear to do it, you could memorize it from Genesis to Revelation. I don't have such a gear. That gear is missing. In my yeah. I'm not good at word. I was never implanted with that no. gear. <laughs> well, so... Uh, He's going to go on and take this a little bit further. He's given us the word. So what? Well, so, seven, so verse 17. Mm -hmm. Here he mentions the word again, but look in what context. He's asking God the Father to sanctify them in the truth. The truth is the word. I think, is that what he says there? Mm -hmm. He says, uh, thy word is true. Now he says, sanctify them. Uh, somebody tell me, what's the word sanctify mean? Also, so. to, yes, to set apart. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, sanctification is a two-sided coin. 
because he does set us apart, but he he sets us apart um, for himself. And he also sets us apart from the world. One side is for God, our sanctification. We're special in God's eyes and in his plan and purpose. Uh, we're special to him. We're his. He sets us apart for himself. He sets us apart uh, for the truth and for his plan and purpose. But he sets us apart from uh, the world. There's a difference. <laughs> and uh, a true Christian demonstrates that in their daily activity and their values and in their thoughts and in their decision making and so on. So he says uh, to the Father, the Lord says, Sanctify, set them apart. And God does it here, according to verse 17. How? In the truth. In the truth. If you don't know God's word, if you don't know the truth, you're in trouble. <clears throat> That's how he sets us apart. We're a unique group, and we're a unique group uh, that lives according to and has the values of and is under the control of the Lord and uh, is working our lives. We're to be special to, to him. Uh, so we end up there. So he's Jesus has accomplished his work. He's now going to the Father, but he's praying for uh, his followers. Isn't that interesting? Uh, he's praying for, and he's saying he's given us the word, and it's uh, he's asking the Father to use the word to set us apart and make us his own special group. Uh, according to his own character and his ways. So uh, we end up with this thought in verse 21. You know, we went through all those verses to come to verse 21 where he says, I do all this, I've done all this, I do this, I want the Father to do this. Why? That they may be all one. one. That they may be one. Was unity in God's mind is one of the last things he's going to deal with before he goes to the cross. Yeah. must be a pretty important uh, issue, a pretty important reason, a pretty important thing in his mind if that's where he takes us here. Thou, he says that they may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. You know, is, is the Trinity uh, unity? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, is that oneness yeah. mean they are all one person? Mm -hmm. No, no, they're, they're different persons, right? The father sent the son. The son came to do the father's will. So the father and the son are two different persons. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so is the Holy Spirit, who Jesus sent to indwell us. So you got the whole Trinity abiding in us to make us able to be one, to be one. And that was going to be my question here. What's one mean? That's why I stuck it up here on the board. And it's going to be interesting to see how to answer that because uh, there are people, there are God's people who have <laughs> repeated God's word over and over and over daily. It was uh, one of the things that uh, a good Jew, a good believer in, in the Jehovah of the Old Testament, um, uh, had them repeat constantly, or they would say, hear, O Israel. You know what the Shema is? The Shema is, is a set of passages that every Jewish little boy has to learn before he goes to Bar Mitzvah to become a man, to be considered an adult. And uh, the Shema uh, was those that key set of scriptural truth, scripture uh, that uh, they had to memorize and repeat and not vary from it. And the first statement that every time was that phrase, was that phrase. And we can read it in uh, Deuteronomy 
chapter six. And verse four repeats it and explains it or tells it. Hear, O, hear, O Israel, listen up. It's kind of what that's saying to him in today's vernacular. Listen up. Pay attention to this. This is important. He says, uh, he says, the Lord is our God. Now, Lord in your Bible is in all caps there. Mm -hmm. And what is that saying? The Father one. God. Yes, it's God, because the Lord can just be a master. A man can be a master. And so, but when it's all in caps, it's YHPH, Yahweh, which is Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that is Jehovah, is our God, and the Lord is one. They said this several times during that. I think the first thing they had to say when they got up in the morning was uh, this, repeat this uh, uh, passage of scripture. So what's What's that mean? The Lord is one. And uh, we're going to be studying unity, and one has a lot to do with unity. And uh, the thing is, we have to be careful to with words, because one means um, this, and if you're using uh, I'm going to look up the Hebrew word for one. And this is what your New Testament says about one in the New Testament. The, the Old Testament's in Hebrew, apparently. And uh, the, the Greek is what the New Testament is. And the one means different things in different places. The noid mean the same thing. And it's very interesting because we'll start with, with the Hebrew. Uh, when you're looking... Look it up. You're going to find two basic, two main words for the word one. It always says one, but it doesn't always say one the same way. In the Hebrew, it'll say, if you'll find this in your Strong's Concordance, number 3173 is this word. I don't know Hebrew, but I know what I'm reading. And it says it's yakid, and, and uh, sometimes it's this kind of a one. And other times, one is translated from this word, uh, which is number 259. This word is unique from this word. Because in this word, yakid, uh, the first one up there, it, uh, it means that, um, that it is one in the sense that we, we would call numerical. One. Uh, a single, um, it's, a, it's a word that means what we normally mean when we say one. It's usually identifying an individual or something that's just one. And uh, it's an absolute. Uh, it's one, kind of we would say one only. And uh, um, something solitary. Just means one. That's this word. But if you look up uh, in Deuteronomy here, the one we just quoted, Deuteronomy 6 4, the Lord is one, is not that word. The word in, in uh, Deuteronomy is this word, ekad. It's a different word from that word. This word means one and one only, numerically. Uh, this word is talking about one in a plural sense. Uh, it's, and I put it up on the board, is this kind of a one is a complex unity. It's saying um, this is, uh, let's see if I could uh, put it in this way, that uh, here's a numerical one, here is a unified one. We have a, I have one family. One in that sense, they would not use this word. They would use this word because the oneness includes a plurality. It's parts to it that all fit together into a unity. 
actually right here in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Israel already had that truth made known to them, that the Jehovah is one. He's a unified one. It doesn't say so here, but it gives room for what? Interpretation. Well, it gives room. No, it does just the opposite. Right. Can interpret the wrong. He's saying the the way that the Lord is one, He's one in the sense of a unity. That gives room for the Trinity. The Trinity, without saying it. So the Hebrew, when you see one mentioned in your text, quick look it up in your your uh, concordance if you're not sure, and see which one of these it is. Because here it's either numerical one and one only, or here it's one that's made up of a group, <clears throat> one church, made yeah. up of all the members and so on, uh, and so on. That's a unity. <clears throat> In the Greek, when we go to the New Testament, they don't follow it this exactly. You get two words there too. In the New Testament, uh, you look the the one word up here in fifteen twenty. And it's the word one, numerical, but it can also mean a complex unity. This one uh, is different. It's not exact like these are. This one here is broader. Here's where you find out what the one means in when it's when it's uh, this word that's in 1520. How do you find out? Which one it means? We'll look at a well. Let's look at a passage. Um, there would be one like um, let's go with um, right where we are in John seventeen verses twenty one through twenty three. That they all may be one. And when you look at one up there, you're going to find it's that number, that number 1520, that kind of a one. And he goes on to say, um, even as the Father and I are one, that is, we're a unified one, but that word can also mean a numerical one. And um, the glory of which thou hast given me, Jesus says to the Father, I have given them that they may be one, see the one there? Mm -hmm. Just as we are one, again, and uh, uh, we see one, two, three ones there, and then in verse 23, he says, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. You got the three ones, and, a, and you got three ones, and one unity, right? Abba uh, mine has the third one. It says that they may become perfectly one. Okay. Same same meaning. Same thing. All you know what? All four of them are the same <laughs> word. Look them up in your Bible. Look them up in your uh, concordance. When it comes down to it, like in mine, where it says unity, uh, it's the same word that's up there and translated one one one. And uh, that kind of a one is this 1520, which is a broad meaning, which means sometimes it can it can be talking about a numerical one and one only. Other times it means a complex uh, unity. So that one's broad. Yeah, and the way you can know what it means is to read the context before and after it and see how it's being used. That That's how you find out what kind of a one it is. But there's a special other word. This word here, um, 1775b, uh, which is penotes. And that word I'm more familiar with in the Greek. I don't know the Hebrew, but the, the Greek penotes is uh, always means a complex unity. And we can see an illustration of that in Ephesians uh, 4. I'm gonna hold your finger in John. Mm -hmm. And go to uh, Ephesians 4. Whoop, I'm right by it. In Ephesians 4, um, verse 3, 
and then we'll drop down to 13. We'll both three and 13. Um, here he's uh, talking about um, the uh, diligence, be diligent to preserve unity of the spirit, oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace. And uh, also down in verse 13, and he said, he gives gifts and prepares and has puts people in places uh, for a specific purpose, he says, until we all attain, there it is again, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. God is uh, concerned with our unity or the lack thereof. It's important to him. He wants, uh, Paul writes here to the Ephesians, says, uh, preserve the unity of the spirit. Notice it's not our unity. Where does unity come from? The spirit. It's people who are in the word, controlled by the word, and uh, people who are uh, into the word, and the word himself is uh, the one who builds and gives peace uh, through the spirit. He's the source of uh, unity. And he says, uh, and of the knowledge of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Uh, so the word there, uh, henotes, is the word that's being used and translated into uh, unity there, not the word for one uh, numerically. I skipped over one thing because we uh, lose time here. Um, so sometimes, um, as we saw in John 17, unity uh, means just one. We have to check the context. But in, in this other word that we find in Ephesians 4, it's a word that means uh, unity and oneness. It's different. That's that is always a complex unity. This one can be, but doesn't have to be. This one, when you find this word, penotes, that word always means a complex unity. So you have both in the Hebrew and in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, you have words that mean one numerically, and words that mean one in a complex unity. You have the same in the New Testament, except this one, this broad one is a little different. But it's still basically the same. One numerically, but you have to context it to see in what way. But this one here is always complex unity. What am I bringing that up for? You think? It's important. <laughs> well, it is important. Uh, a lot of times we see it rule, we only think of it in one way. And uh, and if you think of it one way and it's the wrong way, you're going to have a mixed message. You're going to be telling people and telling yourself and understanding something in error. So uh, this is just a little help along that uh, line. I was going to have us turn to Judges 11, where you had the account uh, in the Old Testament of one was where uh, was it, Jephthah went out to war and he promised God that if he, God gave him the victory when he come in, he would make a sacrifice out of whoever came out his door. <laughs> and uh, in that passage, we're not going to go there, but it'll take my time but we go there and his daughter comes out and he, he said he says right afterwards he he was bemoaning when his daughter came out and he says she's my only child and this is the word he uses yeah she's the only one i've got in fact she's not just my only daughter she's my only child she's the only one he had he had no other girls or boys she was it add some meaning to the the pain that, that jephthah was going through 
at that time and some understanding of uh, what must have been in his heart and in his relationship with the Lord at that time. Um, uh, so, and we were already talking about Ekad uh, being that word, which is in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Uh, let's see, I want to just say, um, in our New Testament, uh, just a couple minutes, uh, and then I want to change to how we're going to use our, go through our course. This is important. In fact, it's Paul later says this is most important. You think unity is most important in churches? You think unity is the most important in our church? Do you think unity is the most important in my understanding in my life? That kind of unity that God speaks of here? Jesus saw it as important. Later, Paul, God used Paul to speak to it in 1 Corinthians. If you want to uh, turn there to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, just verses uh, 3 and 4. Uh, it's given the gospel here. It's telling them what the gospel is, explaining it. Uh, but look at, he says um, about uh, the gospel. First, uh, First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I delivered to you, the next phrase is the one I'm underscoring and want us to take notice of. <clears throat> I delivered to you as of what? First of first importance. First importance, is that what your Bible says? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm delivering to you a message, top of the line importance. This is no small thing for Paul. And, and I believe that's the case because it's no small thing for the Lord. And he knew the Lord. He knows the Lord and he knows the word. And he knows the importance that unity and oneness really embraces. I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. And then he goes on to uh, tell about the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. Verse 4, that he was buried and raised. And, and then verse 5, he appeared to Peter, uh, and he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, and that he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Yeah, it's important. It's important. It's so important that the gospel is based on it. That's how important unity is, how important oneness is. Uh, and again, later in another letter, he wrote to Ephesus. Uh, I can get to it real quick. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 3, he uh, also adds this comment to it, that uh, not only is it important, you better pay attention to, and not only maintain, uh, but uh, getting, getting in that position, but maintaining it too. See what he says in verse three? He says, uh, uh, be diligent to preserve what? The unity. The unity, the unity that comes by whom? The spirit. By the spirit. This is not your homemade self-done mm -hmm. unity. This is the unity that comes out of the word of God and it comes into our lives as a, a work of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to bind us together, to meld us together, to make us one in this complex unity sense. First thing, uh, I th think I can say this accurately, the first thing the spirit does to us the moment we're saved is he places us right into the body of Christ. That's spiritual baptism. He, uh, we become a child of God. He places us into the body of Christ, and we become one of the members of the body. That's the complex unity. So he says here in 4.3, he said, preserve what it is that the Spirit has used his word uh, to build into us. 
And uh, he says, <laughs> when, when the Holy Spirit does that, he uses a special glue. Notice it mentioned here, he says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, that is the unity wrought by the Spirit, uh, be diligent to preserve it in the bond, the glue of peace. What does God glue us together with? What does God make us one together in unity with? Peace. Peace. Peace is the bond. Peace is what binds us together. Uh, when people are unified by the Holy Spirit into a unit, that unit is glued together. And you can see the... How did the, how did the unsaved people used to recognize a, a Christian? What's the scripture tell us? By their love, by love. By their love for one another. Mm -hmm. That's how they can tell. Mm -hmm. They're glued together, and uh, even the world can record, see it. They don't understand it, but they can see it. Bond of peace. Okay, I've got to stop at this point because we've got 10 minutes to go over how we're going to approach uh, this unity in Jesus with the materials. Uh, let me take one and pass it on. <laughs> yeah just kind of thumb through this real quickly um, and uh, I am going to uh, give you an assignment for next week but the assignment starts today <laughs> there's an introduction here um, in the front just a two couple pages mm. yeah just two pages Today, uh, it's some time when you've got a, a when you can sit down and think and uh, pay attention to what you're reading. We'll just read the introduction here. Um, it's just a couple pages long. Um, but for next week, uh, we're going to do what they call here day one. We're going to call it lesson one. And uh, you'll see there's, there's two pages to it. One page has nothing on it, but the scripture already printed. You don't have to get your Bible out, but you should. <laughs> uh, you got is a, a passage of scripture and then space. We we'll talked about that space. Um, but what you have on the other side is a short devotional. All I want you to read today is the introduction. Not the first lesson. Uh, just read the introduction and keep one uh, simple thought in mind, if you would. And that is don't read the devotional side of lesson one until later in the week, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, doesn't matter. This comes later. What I want you to do first is spend the the week doing this side. I don't know your study methods. I don't know how you go about studying a passage, but you've been given a passage here of three verses. Acts 4, 32 through 35. So you're not you're not being hit with a lot of study, only three verses. But I don't want you to read somebody else's devotional based on that. I want you to give God the first whack at your mind. <laughs> Not somebody what God taught somebody else. Take these four verses and study them through the week. And then toward the end of the week, go ahead and, and uh, indulge yourself and see what somebody else thought about it. Right? Don't read this one first. Now, good, I got a minute, <laughs> a few minutes. I'm going to suggest something you can do. Uh, this is just um, free. <laughs> um, everybody doesn't have a, a method of studying these three verses. Uh, the first thing, uh, here's uh, kind of the idea that I use in, in my studies. 
take and leave it as the Lord leads you. But the first thing I do in my study is I read those passages several times. For three verses, you can read them. In 20 minutes, you could probably read them 10 times. Read, 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 and try to grasp what's in there that, that strikes your mind and your heart right up front. So do that maybe Monday. Read, 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 read several times. And then Tuesday, now you uh, check the context. You say, okay, I've read this. I know what that says. I can see what it says. But in what, what was the uh, neighborhood like that that was given to uh, uh, the people then? What came before it? And then what follows it? So now I can see what I've read and become so familiar with within the context of the whole picture. So Tuesday, you could check those contexts out. Take note if there's anything special about it. Wednesday, go through it and look every single word. Make sure you understand every word that's in those three verses. If there's any word in those three verses that you're not sure what is meant by that, get out your Webster. Good old, plain old dictionary. Webster, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure you understand every single word, because if you don't get the words right, you're not getting the message right. So that's the thing. Then the next day, uh, <clears throat> deal with this question in your mind and in your heart. What did the, what does these three verses, what do you think was understood by the people of 2,000 years ago? What, what was the situation that they were given this in? How did they, why, uh, what would they be thinking when they read these? Not me, what would they be thinking? So you uh, check out the uh, original uh, application uh, and you can say, well, I think you meant this overall. And uh, this, if you notice things in different passages, passages it would be uniquely understood by people 2,000 years ago rather than today. Jot that down, and then the next day, ask yourself, well, that's what it meant to them. What principles do I see there? What do I see there that meant to them that would apply to me and in what way in this day and age? So you're now you're taking the thought from uh, the original receivers to yourself. So you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, commentary. Commentary. Or uh, if you have a lot of commentaries in your library at home, check what uh, some other Bible students and theologians say about those three verses. And check out, and sometimes you'll learn things you never even thought of. God, God teaches through men. Uh, the Holy Spirit uses uh, a lot of times what he's taught Joe to, to get the word to Sam. Uh, we can learn from one another. And so read commentaries, make any notes you want to, and then next Sunday we'll share. Come to share. And uh, so what I would expect to see is the results of going through something like that written over here. And you'll have it for later yourself. So um, the devotional thing will be a, a, an add-on for you that um, will bless you. They're good. I like the, the Daily Bread writers. They, uh, they pull things out. And a lot of times you'll say, you know, that's exactly what I thought. I see it. I, and now I know why they say it. If you don't have a method of study, Develop one. Don't have to be mine. Develop a method that you can approach any passage on and so that you're careful to um, get what God really has in there for the original hearers and for us as well. He says he's given us his word. All of this, all scripture is good for, and he lists it out. So everything is in there for a purpose. And we need to we need to dig down and find out what that purpose is. This is my approach, uh, generally. And uh, there's different things about doing each of these. 
that you can learn from one another through as well. Uh, I, I spend a lot more time than most people do on words because I like to take the words and check them out um, as they were originally to make sure our English translation is saying the same thing accurately. Now, um, so uh, you've got this, uh, did every, we have enough good. Um, we'll do one of these a week, which should be should be easy because there's only a few verses each we look through there. There's no more than five, four or five verses. So it'll be a good experience for not only becoming aware of God's answer for unity, but also for us to learn how to dig into his word a little bit more and practice some things we maybe have let go over the years. Any thoughts on your part? We've got a minute? I think this is going to be great. Yeah. I think it's a, a, really a strong need among us believers for our, not only our own life, but our church life, our ministry life. Uh, every Christian is, uh, there's no few sitters in heaven. Uh, and, uh, God is a uh, an intimate relationship, and uh, we're all ministers of His Word, and we all serve under the uh, direction of the High Priest in the heavenlies, our Lord. And uh, so, um, this uh, this is much needed, and we can tell by the activities around us in all these different settings. But, we're mostly interested in in our Christian life and in our Christian service, because we're servants. He's the master, we're the servants. And the closer we walk with him and let him control, he brings about things like unity and peace in ways that come from him only. We can't manufacture him ourselves. Only God can do this. It's his work. You ready for next week? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the decision. <laughs> Get ready for next week. I hope so. I think we'll have a great time. So uh, let's pray and, and uh, be ready for um, uh, for Brother Scott's message later here. Father, we uh, enjoy your word and we enjoy you. We want you to enjoy us. We want to be those who walk with you. We want to be those who reflect you. We want to be those who draw attention to you and praise to your name. And uh, we want to send ahead of us those things that uh, will bring praise to you, not only in time, but in eternity. So we love you and we're glad you drew us to yourself and look forward to what you have for us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.